tutti e un caloroso benvenuto a tutti. Come al solito, soprattutto, non perché siano diciamo, più importanti, ma perché affrontano un viaggio per raggiungerci a quelli che vengono da lontano, dal profondo nord e dal profondo sud e anche dall'estero, perché anche questa volta abbiamo chi ci raggiunge dall'estero, cioè dalla Germania, eh, in realtà però dalla Colombia. Quindi veramente un benvenuto a tutti, e iniziamo questo seminario che in realtà non è solo l'inizio del seminario, ma è l'inizio di questo nuovo anno accademico per la Sistri, e che diciamo così inaugura oggi un nuovo anno di seminario permanente. Questo anno non è un anno che, ehm, non è un anno che, che è parte di un triennio, ma avevamo pensato quest'anno di offrire un anno un po' più interessante, intermezzo tra un triennio e un altro. Però abbiamo, abbiamo deciso di dedicarlo a un tema fondamentale per noi, che è la verità. E il primo relatore che abbiamo pensato di invitare è il professor Dominique Lambert, che ringrazio moltissimo per essere qui, dopo lo introdurremo un po' meglio, dicendo eh, le tante cose importanti che ha fatto fino ad oggi però intanto ci tenevo a dargli un benvenuto caloroso. Very welcome. Thank you for the video. Grazie. Eh, il titolo di questo seminario è eh, Conoscere la realtà. Che cos'è la verità scientifica? Quindi il primo focus sarà diciamo, riflettere sul tema de della verità eh, in scienza, sia nelle scienze formali, sia nelle scienze empiriche, come il professor Lambert ci, 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 illustrerà, ci illustrerà oggi. Però evidentemente di, di verità non si parla soltanto di scienza, meno male. E quindi il tema di quest'anno è un po' una domanda che ci siamo fatti e che vogliamo continuare a farci insieme eh, durante quest'anno, e cioè dove abita la verità, dove risiede la verità, dove la troviamo questa verità, o quantomeno dove dobbiamo cercarla questa verità. E quindi, eh, a cominciare dal seminario, dal seminario odierno, per tutti i quattro incontri di quest'anno, ci interrogheremo su quali sono i contesti in cui la verità di fatto viene cercata o quantomeno dovrebbe essere cercata. Questa è un po' la sfida. E noi abbiamo pensato a quattro contesti in cui ci sembra che la questione della verità e quindi, come dice il sottotitolo di questo anno, una riflessione eh, sul vero e sul falso nell'epoca contemporanea potesse, dovesse essere fatta nel contesto scientifico, grazie appunto anche al professor Lambert oggi, nel, nel, nelle discipline storiche, nella storia, dove, e questo sarà il tema del prossimo seminario del 30 novembre, dove evidentemente l'accertamento dei fatti e della verità potrebbe dover essere una, una, una priorità, nell'era dell'informazione, quindi tra dati e anche informazione nel senso di media, di stampa, no? su questo poi dirò una cosa in più anche per alleggerire questa mia introduzione, e poi ovviamente in teologia, nel contesto di teologia di fede, eh, che come di consueto è un po' l'ultimo gradino del programma degli anni accademici dei seminari della Sisri, e e che sarà il 21 marzo, quest'ultimo seminario, il cui relatore principale sarà il nostro professor Pantella. Volevo spendere altre due parole su perché la questione della verità è così urgente e un tema così serio. Eh, e lo volevo fare, prima di tutto, raccontandovi un piccolo aneddoto che mi è capitato il 26 marzo scorso, e adesso capirete perché ricordo la data con molta precisione, perché per una serie di diciamo, convenienti, mi trovai a mangiare, a fare un frugale pranzo in una pizzeria, vicino a casa peraltro, non avevo tempo di tornare a casa, e lì mentre mangiavo questo pezzetto di pizza che mi ero comprato, eh, ho sfogliato i due giornaletti che regalano nella metropolitana di Roma, Le Leggo e Metro. Ho sfogliato il primo e c'era una notizia di cronaca nella seconda pagina. Ho sfogliato il secondo e c'era la stessa notizia di cronaca. Solo che i titoli dei due articoli su questi due giornali erano questi. Cioè, il primo diceva che Battisti aveva detto che era una guerra giusta, assolutamente nel merito 
secondo la vicenda, il secondo, stesso giorno, stessa pagina, diceva che lui aveva detto che era una guerra sbagliata. Ecco, due titoli assolutamente opposti in un lato. Questo era un po' per introdurre l'importanza di come, diciamo così, interrogarsi sulla verità può avere effetti e ramificazioni molto, molto, diciamo, importanti. Ha rivisto che la questione è seria, eh, arriviamo a dire due parole in più, credo che mi sia saltata una slide, arriviamo a dire due parole in più su, che cos'è, su cosa noi diciamo, su, su quali sono le tematiche che vogliamo mettere in campo quest'anno con questi seminari. Evidentemente il primo seminario è la questione scientifica. Oggi molti scienziati, molti uomini di scienza, alcuni scienziati, alcuni uomini di scienza tendono a credere che la loro impresa non sia un'impresa diciamo eh, dedicata alla ricerca della verità, quanto piuttosto possono assumere atteggiamenti convenzionalisti, strumentalisti o anche molto pragmatisti, su questo penso che il professor Lambert oggi ci darà qualcosa, ma evidentemente il buon scienziato è quello che ancora crede che dietro al suo sforzo ci sia la ricerca della verità. La stessa cosa in cui, diciamo nelle scienze umane, che possono essere almeno in questo ambiente simboleggiate dalla storia, come ho già detto, ma anche dal diritto. In questi casi molto spesso lo storico può, può lasciarsi tentare da un approccio ideologico alla sua ricerca e magari l'esperto di diritto può, lasciar, può lasciarsi tentare da una certa convenienza nel suo lavoro, ma in realtà potrebbe essere il caso di ricordare che queste due imprese, eh, diciamo intellettuali ma non solo, eh, debbono comunque avere come riferimento e come mira l'accertamento la, dei fatti da qui il titolo un po' del secondo seminario, accertare i fatti. Poi è ovvio, viviamo ormai nell'era dell'informazione, dell siamo bombardati da informazione da qualsiasi, da qualsiasi punto di vista e allora il terzo seminario che ci terrà Michele Grutelli, che è qui tra noi anche oggi, come sempre, affronterà proprio questo tema, il tema dei big data e di come dai dati si può, non si può, si deve e non si deve ricavare verità e ovviamente ci sarà anche poi, immagino, un diciamo una parte del seminario che rifletterà su appunto il tema dell'informazione per come l'avevo accennato prima, no? cioè diciamo i media in qualche modo. E infine arriveremo all'ultimo seminario su accogliere l'essere che è appunto un aspetto, forse la, quello apicale, della ricerca della verità e quindi cercheremo di vedere come la verità è un dono e come eh, questa verità ci viene donata. Questo così per introdurre un po' le tematiche. Visto che ci sono diversi eh, ragazzi nuovi, diciamo così, cioè persone che per la prima volta oggi si uniscono a un seminario Sisteri, poi magari si, si presenteranno, volevo così anche brevemente richiamare un po' quella che è la missione, la visione e l'impegno della Sisteri. La prima priorità, diciamo così, che sta anche nel nome, perché Sisteri significa Scuola Internazionale Superiore per la Ricerca Interdisciplinare, è proprio un approccio interdisciplinare che però noi intendiamo in maniera veramente ampia, come molti di voi sanno, cioè un'interdisciplinarità che non sia solamente il confronto tra campi attivi, che so, biologia molecolare e biochimica, ma che possa mettere insieme eh, campi anche distanti e che possa anche includere in questa impresa la filosofia e la teologia, non solamente discipline scientifiche, siano esse naturali o umane. Il secondo tema, evidentemente molto legato a questo, è quello dell'unità della conoscenza, e cioè il fatto di diciamo, la sfida, in questo caso è quella di cercare di trovare un equilibrio, un bilancio, una, 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 una soluzione diciamo, che tenga insieme la necessaria specializzazione, di cui oggi non si può fare a meno, con l'attenzione al, 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 al quadro d'insieme, alla big picture. Questa è sempre più una sfida perché sempre più tutti siamo chiamati ad essere specialisti di qualcosa, ma dovremmo cercare di farlo senza perdere appunto di vista quella big picture. E quindi dalla big picture alle big questions, alle grandi domande, alla fine il culmine di questa impresa è quello di interrogarsi a partire dalle specificità disciplinari di cui ognuno di noi è specialista, però interrogandosi appunto sulle grandi domande, quelle di senso, quelle fondamentali, quelle sulle origini per esempio, che è un tema che secondo me tornerà diciamo, anche oggi e lo affronteremo di più. E infine, un'altra cosa che piace alla Sisteri di promuovere è quella di un'azione, un diciamo così, di un influsso sull'ambiente accademico dall'interno. Ecco perché la Sisteri cerca di circondarsi di giovani, docenti, ricercatori, professori 
che abbiano un ruolo diciamo così, nell'impresa culturale attuale e che magari riescano quindi a portare il loro apporto a seguito di questa missione. E l'altra cosa è quella di lavorare insieme, quello che faremo in fondo oggi e che facciamo sempre in tutti gli eventi della stessa. Diciamo il grosso della mia introduzione qui è finito, mi lascio andare a uno spot pubblicitario perché la Sisri, che certamente è, diciamo, eh, ha il suo centro, anche proprio fisicamente qui a Roma, però è un'impresa che sempre più si va interregionalizzando e inter, eh, internazionalizzando. E, e allora ci sono anche delle sezioni locali di Sistri, no? due delle quali sono a Bologna e a Bari, entrambe qui rappresentate da Don Alberto Stromi e da Michele Crudele. Questo è il programma del, del, degli incontri di Bologna di quest'anno e dall'altra parte c'è il programma degli incontri di Bari. Quindi se qualcuno di voi non sapesse chi è Mendel, eh, il 29 ottobre potrà recarsi a Bari e scoprire chi è Mendel, che è in effetti un personaggio molto importante anche per il dialogo tra scienze e Detto questo io passo la parola a Maria che ci ha da dirci alcune cose interessanti, forse più interessanti di quelle che ho detto io. Prego. E... Io sono Pedro Lentamento, non sono della Caterina. E... Allora, prima di tutto questi siamo noi di oggi e chiamo lei chi è il nuovo a Sono docente al contratto da Federico II nel campo del diritto commerciale, è un insegnamento tra l'altro nel corso di laurea in lingua inglese e si tratta dell'influenza delle direttive e dei regolamenti europei sul diritto commerciale. La, il dottorato di ricerca che ho svolto all'Università di Salerno, pur sempre nel diritto commerciale, mi sono laureato in giurisprudenza a Napoli. Durante il dottorato ho trascorso un periodo di studi all'Università di Oxford e eh, nonostante la specializzazione sia quella del diritto commerciale ho sempre cercato di coltivare interessi anche con altre branche del diritto e in senso più ampio nelle scienze umane ecco perché mi sento molto attratto da questa scuola per cui vi ringrazio per la ospitalità ah, sono Elisabetta eh, vengo da Trieste ho la laurea in chimica dottorato in nanotecnologie, quindi buttata sulla fisica e adesso lavoro alla gestione di un progetto europeo per le nanoscienze. Sì. Io sono Danny, di Montiere da Trieste e mi sono appena laureato in fisica della materia. Noi lavoriamo sui superconduttori e sulle sorgenti laser che servono per studiare i superconduttori. E comincio a lavorare per il dottorato. Mi ha fatto una piccola parola che mi ha fatto un'idea di una storia di una storia di una storia di una di Thank you. 
c'è la comunità misa, presentazione del workshop, di maggio e da San Luisa di fine luglio. E diciamo, tanto per dirvi i punti di forza che io sono una grandissima fan, eh, che diciamo, sono in tante occasioni che sia di interdisciplinarità, quindi di imparare a parlare veramente con tutti, cioè il filosofo di linee e cose impensabili, e poi anche di dare una licenza, e invece il posto dove si deve fare la summer school è veramente stupendo. E, ok. E a questo punto eh, chiedo la parola a Eva. Ok, grazie Maria. Il microfono perché adesso mi è gradito il compito di introdurre il nostro speaker. Quindi, intanto lo accoglierei con un bel applauso. E evidentemente, potrei spendere altri 15 minuti per dirvi tutto ciò che il professor Caldera ha fatto. Avete una scheda biografica nel vostro, nelle vostre cartelline, quindi alcune cose che non dirò le potrete trovare qui. Il professor Lambert viene, è professore ordinario alla Università di Namur, dove lavora sia nella facoltà di scienze che nella facoltà di lettere e filosofia, e questo è molto interessante per noi, per continuare a coltivare quella interdisciplinarità di cui sopra. E ha, un, ha due dottorati, evidentemente, uno in fisica e uno in filosofia, tra l'altro quello in filosofia l'ho preso sotto la guida del professor Jean Ladrière, che è un personaggio noto diciamo, a tutti quelli che studiano filosofia, è un filosofo vero, Jean mm -hmm. Lavier, è un real philosopher, esatto. one of the great philosophers of this century. E, diciamo, non, 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 non posso qui elencare tutte le sue pubblicazioni specialistiche perché sono più di 200, troverete però alcuni libri segnalati, i suoi, suoi libri segnalati nella scheda che avete, perché sono, questi libri sono veramente come dire, molto vicini ai temi che stanno a cuore anche alla Sistri, perché sono tutti, sono tutti libri che si occupano in qualche modo di questa interdisciplinarità ampia, del rapporto tra scienza e teologia, tra scienza e fede, si occupano di scienziati credenti e anche di quella necessaria apertura metafisica che la scienza sembra presupporre. Forse la cosa più importante che devo dire è che il professor, è, il professor Lambert appunto, è uno dei più grandi esperti al mondo di Lemaitre, L'anno scorso ci sono state delle celebrazioni, un grande convegno eh, su questo tema e i suoi contributi su questo, di cui ne avete uno nella lista di libri, che, anzi forse due, uno in italiano e uno in inglese, che è nella lista di libri che avete e quindi lui è sicuramente una figura di riferimento per gli studi di Lemaitre, su Lemaitre. E, a proposito del quale è anche come dire, bello ricordare che proprio l'anno scorso quella che a tutti gli astronomi qui presenti e anche al grande pubblico era nota come la Hubble Law, la legge di Hubble, in realtà è stata ribattezzata legge di Hubble Le Maire, mm -hmm. perché in realtà si è riconosciuto, la società astronomica internazionale credo, ha riconosciuto la paternità di questa legge non soltanto all'americano Hubble ma anche al sacerdote cattolico Le Maire. e questo per noi è stato come dire, un motivo di gioia in io adesso non vorrei rubare molto più tempo alla presentazione del professor Lambert, quindi ring lo ringrazio ancora per Grazie essere qui. E ricordo il tema della sua presentazione, che è appunto conoscere la realtà, knowing reality, what is scientific truth, cos'è la verità scientifica, cercheremo di scoprirlo anche grazie alla sua presentazione e poi al lavoro di gruppo che ci sarà dopo la sua presentazione. Quindi, thank you. Thank you very much for the, your kind presentation uh, and thank you very much uh, for this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure and honor for me to, to give you some, uh, yes, thank you, to propose you some ideas, some modest ideas uh, concerning truth in, uh, in, in science. Okay, thank you very much. And I have to, I have to begin my, my talk saying that, in fact, we, we have to distinguish very carefully uh, the truths in, in the field of formal sciences, logic and mathematics, and uh, 
and truth in natural sciences, in physics, chemistry, biology, and so on, engineering sciences uh, also, uh, because uh, truth in formal sciences has some specificities, has some very special uh, features, and sometimes in formal uh, sciences, one confuses truth uh, with provability, but it is really important to distinguish the former and the, the latter. Provability of a statement, of a mathematical statement or logical statement, is its property to be deduced step by step from actions of a formal language using the rule of deduction, the logical rules. But this is a, a purely formal or syntactic, syntactic pro process. On the contrary, the notion of truth, of a statement, of a formal language, requires to work with a model of this formal language. Formal language is a language uh, based on symbols, on syntactic rules, uh, aiming to construct uh, well-formed uh, sentences, and then you choose axioms, you, you give uh, deduction rule, and then step by step, you produce by deduction theorems. But this is a purely mechanical and syntactical uh, process. But the notion of, of truth in, in mathematics and, and logic is not only that. Truth is not only probability. Because truth is a relation uh, between a formal sentence uh, to some situation in a model. What, what's a model? A model is a collection of intuitive objects, for example, intuitive natural numbers, the, 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 man, the numbers you are uh, using to, to count, or intuitive points or lines or planes in Euclidean uh, geometry, in which the axioms and the theorems of a formal language are satisfied. A model is a collection of intuitive objects you are, uh, you are presupposing, and, and then a model is a collection on which the axioms are satisfied. You can check directly that it is satisfied. For example, you, you, you give the Euclidean plane, and you check that in your intuitive model, then the axioms are satisfied. This is uh, the notion of, uh, of model, and if we are considering a formula or axioms in a given formal language, we can build what we call an interpretation of this language, translating the formal statements into statements that have some meaning in this collection of intuitive objects we are using. Let us take a, a simple example. If you consider a formal formula saying x, star y equal y star x. This is a purely uh, a set of symbols. But you can interpret this formula in a set of intuitive numbers, for example. x is a number, intuitive natural number. y is also a natural number, intuitive one. Equal is equal, and star is, for example, uh, addition. And then you interpret your formula in this intuitive field, and then you check that x star y equal y star x is, in fact, the expression of commutativity, for example, of the addition in this intuitive field. But you, you have to consider the, the, the difference between the formal, the formal expression, okay, without any meaning, and the expression in the model which gives some meaning to the formal symbol. If you consider only probability, you are in the context of deduction in a formal language. But the truth in mathematics is not only that. It is a relation between formal expression and, uh, ob and some situation in uh, the intuitive uh, model. Okay, what is first noting is that 
we have not given a formal definition of this intuitive uh, model of this intuitive formula, we took as granted this set, intuitive set, and we are considering it as pre-understood. This, the model is a kind of reality, a formal reality, a kind of res, a mathematical thing to which the formula, the formulae are referring. Thus, in mathematics and, and even in logic, we have already some kind of prefiguration of a correspondence between a sentence in a formal language and a kind of objects of thought, a, men, a mental reality. But it is a kind of correspondence, adequatio rei et intellectus, but this res, this thing, is a formal thing. It's not an empirical one. Because, for example, if you consider uh, points in Euclidean space, you immediately uh, understand what I mean by a point. But the point is, is not some, something which is uh, empirical, because you said, uh, no, no, uh, the, this is not a point. This is not a point. Because uh, you say, no, it, it has some uh, extension. Then, no, it is not a point. The, the point is a, a formal thing, but this is kind of a formal reality. And you have, in mathematics, already this kind of idea of correspondence between the language and some otherness, some alterity. And this is very important for our, uh, our seminar, I think. Even in mathematics, in mathematics and logic, the truth, correspondence, the notion of truth as a correspondence, as a relation, uh, is very rich. A theorem proved by Gödel proved that every non-contradictory formal uh, language has a model. This is not the incompleteness theorem. The, this is a famous theorem thing. If a formal language is uh, consistent, non-contradictory, then this language has at least one model. Then if you have some kind of consistent language, you have at least one intuitive world in which the axioms are satisfied. But this is very interesting because it defines also the existence in, uh, in formal science. What, what is reality? Reality is, in, in fact, what it is defined in, in a model. Okay? But if you are consistent, then there exists a kind of formal reality corresponding to your uh, formal uh, language. There exists always a way to define truth if you start with a coherent thought. Coherent, coherency here define, in fact, a relation with a, a kind of formal reality. But there is more. At the beginning of the 20th century, Levenheim and Scholem proved that if a formal language has a model of infinite cardinal, infinite number of elements in the, the model, it has model of whole cardinalities. This is surprising, but also very interesting with regards to philosophy, because it means that a language sufficiently rich is unable to grasp univocally the correspondence to a world that to the world that is describing. Because if the model, if the, the formal language has a model with infinite numbers of, of things, then there is an infinite number of other models corresponding to this formal language. Then there is some kind of uh, uh, rich correspondence between the, the formal languages and, and uh, reality. But the language is unable to uh, pinpoint only one world to which it is corresponding. There is some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of rich uh, relation between formal language and the set of all uh, models. Today, there are many very deep works concerning the links between language and the collection of all its model. What is called category uh, theory, uh, is used to um, 
describe the set of all these models of a formal language, the category of, of model, and uh, maybe uh, you have studied or, or you have seen the, the, the beautiful work of Olivia Caramello and Laurent Laforgue, the field medalist, uh, who, uh, who have written a nice paper describing a category involving a universal model of a language, a model generating all the models of uh, the language and containing, if you want, the core of the language uh, semantics. The truth in mathematics is thus not only contained in formal axiomatics, but it is emerging from the links uh, and the back and forth relation between its axiomatics and uh, the, the models. The truth in formal language is not only in the, the formal language, but uh, truth is in fact uh, is in fact describing a relation, a correspondence between the formal language and the set of all its model. And this is uh, important to grasp this model idea. The contemporary logic has given many important results concerning the mathematical truth. Let us refer, for example, <laughs> let us re refer, for example, to, to Gödel incompleteness theorem. The theorem states that in any formal language containing the axioms of elementary axiomatic, the Peano axioms, for example, there exists always a statement that, is, that it is undecidable, not provable, but its negation is also non-provable. But nevertheless, this statement could be interpreted as true in an intuitive model. And this is very uh, important. And uh, in, in the 50s, Professor Jean Ladrière worked, uh, wrote his PhD thesis on the interpretation of this Gödel theory in terms of uh, philosophy. And what is important to realize here is that truth is not completely computable, even in, in formal uh, sciences. Truth can, in fact, exceed uh, calculability. Indeed, a proof is a step-by-step -step process that produces a theorem from axiom in finite time. But this is precisely what a computation is. And Gödel theorem shows in a certain sense that truth in formal science cannot be completely obtained by an algorithm, by a computation. Intuition and reflection is needed to get the truth even in uh, formal uh, sciences. And this result is, is very important even if we consider formal languages, it means that it, it means language such that any truth is, uh, it, it means that in, in a formal language, there are truths truth which are not provable. A, a theorem, an, a statement can be true in a model, but not provable from the uh, formal language. But it means, in, in fact, that truth cannot be produced by algorithmic means, even in, in formal, uh, in, in, in formal uh, sciences. And even if we consider complete language, you, you know, I have said that Gödel theory, uh, theorem said that if, if uh, an axiomatical system contains the axiomatics of uh, elementary arithmetics, there is, uh, there is always a statement which is provable, not, not provable, but uh, interpreted as true. But it, it means that probability implies truth, probability implies truth, if the system is well built, is correct. But truth does not imply probability. And this is the incompleteness. 
But in some circumstances, a, a formal language can be complete. Uh, for example, if you take the, the logic of uh, the first order predicate, the, the logic for the Aristotelian syllogism, this theory is complete. Then you can prove, and Gödel proved that, if something is proved in predicate first order predicate logic, you can, it is interpreted as true. And if you can uh, check that it is true, then you can prove in, in the formal system of uh, first order predicate logic. The system is complete, but even, even in a complete language, you have no algorithmic procedure to know if some particular statement is provable. You know that if the, it is provable, it is true. If it is true, it is provable. But I give you a statement, and I ask you, uh, is it provable? I don't know. I, I have to, to, to build the proof. But there is no general algorithm to, to decide immediately, yes, it is provable. Then you can start the proof, and uh, OK. Then it is very interesting, and some uh, French mathematician, uh, Dovek, uh, said that, in fact, uh, it, it, it shows that uh, to reason, the, the, the reasoning in formal science is not only uh, characterized by uh, some kind of mechanical process. If you want to discover truth, you, you have to use more than computation, more than mechanical process, even in a complete language. But this is very interesting, because there is something which is uh, intuitive, something uh, which needs some reasoning, which is more than computation. And in fact, of course, if, if you know algorithmics or uh, if you know formal logic, you know that this is related to uh, a Turing's theorem. Because Turing uh, proved uh, this famous uh, halting uh, problem. And uh, because to say, well, this is provable, it means that uh, you have to prove that an algorithm will compute uh, the theorems, if you want, and this program will stop. But there is no general algorithm able to say that some arbitrary program with arbitrary data will stop or not. This is the halting problem. Then you have something very uh, interesting. Uh, in, in mathematics and logic, you have already some notion of correspondence, truth as correspondence. You, you may like a, a formalist, you, you may have this idea that mathematics and logic is something purely formal. You, you are playing with formula, with, with symbols and so on. But it is not true. Mathematics and logic is not, is not only to play with formula, formulas. No, because in order to discover new formulas, in order to have some ideas about conjectures, theorem, you have to inject intuition coming from models. No? If you construct an axiomatics, you start from intuitive model, then you build the axiomatics, and then you deduce theorem, and you interpret in some model. But in order to build the axiomatics, and in order to have some idea to prove some theorems, you need some intuition coming from models. Then you, you need some back and forth relation between language and anotherness, an alterity, if you want. And then this notion of truth as correspondence has already a, a meaning inside formal sciences. And this is very important, because uh, to, to think about the, the foundation of this effectiveness of, of mathematics in natural sciences, but already in, uh, in mathematics, you have some kind of internalization of the correspondence relation between some language and 
some reality which gives you the meaning of your language. There is already a semantics. And this is the, uh, the core um, of uh, the, the study of Caramello and, and, and Lafort, stu um, focusing on semantics, not only on syntax, but uh, uh, also in uh, uh, semantics. Well, because we, we in, the, in the title of, of uh, my, my talk is uh, Truth in Science, and usually we, we forget truth in, in, in mathematics because uh, we say, well, but there is no problem with truth because uh, we are proving something, we are working in imaginary world and so on, but uh, it is not completely uh, true. We, we have to, to, to root so the, the truth concept uh, also in, in, in mathematics and, uh, and logic. Okay. Now I, I want to, to shift to another point. Today there, there is a question in concerning what uh, science is, and it is related to our uh, question. There exists a trend saying that theory is not yet needed. We need only data and analysis of this data via artificial neural networks that perform deep learning and, and extract regularities without uh, an a priori explanatory scheme. Let, let us quote, for example, the paper published in June 2008 by the redactor-in-chief of the famous review Wyatt, the end of theory, the data deluge, makes scientific method obsolete. Or the paper written by Schmidt and Lipson proposing in, in Nature in 2009 uh, to find free form natural laws from experimental data. And they did not presuppose, uh, they did not presuppose the principle of mechanics and derive laws only from experimental data. This means that science could be derived from algorithms that not only reproduce the observation or the experimental data, as in the classical conventionalism of Pierre Duhem or uh, Poincaré, sciences are only saving the facts, uh, the famous Tsozaita phenomena, uh, but gives you a path to uh, theory. But this is questionable because, as we have seen, truth, even in formal science, implies some intuition, some thought, in order to choose axiom and to find the detail of, of the proof. Then there is something very important today because uh, artificial intelligence is modifying also the representation of what science is. Okay? Science based on correlation and, and not on, on causality, uh, on data and, and not uh, on, on theory. But this is uh, precisely uh, the vanishing of, uh, of the truth, of a correspondence between, the importance of a correspondence between data, okay, and data, the world uh, found, uh, found in the world, and a theory we, we, uh, which gives meaning to, to, to the data. But is there some hope to find truth also in natural uh, science? And I want to I want to argue here that, in, in fact, we cannot, we cannot uh, lose the truth concept in, in science. Uh, because uh, today, uh, some people and also philosophers are saying that uh, it, it is uh, impossible to, to get truth in, in, in science. Uh, we have uh, correlation, we have uh, uh, of observation, we have uh, approximate uh, theories and so on, but we, we have not really truth. But I, I want to suggest, and this is a question for you for the debate, in fact, uh, I, I want to argue that in science, in natural sciences, uh, there is something important in this concept of, uh, of uh, truth. The question here is to know if science can effectively build a correspondence between a theory and, and a reality. And one can object immediately that this reality is described by a theory 
then we cannot be sure that the reality is not produced by the theory or by the instruments used to detect some feature of reality. In order to answer this question, we have to dig deeply inside the scientific practices. And what is interesting to discover is that all the structure of scientific activity is, in fact, organized as if the intention would be to track anotherness, an alterity, at least partly independent uh, from us. If you study carefully the structure of scientific activity, you, you cannot pretend that uh, truth is not necessary because it is at the core of the scientific uh, activity. But we, we have to, to prove this. If you come back to the, the history, for uh, example, the discovery of the CMB, the Cosmological Microwave Background, this famous discovery in 1960, uh, 90, yes, 65 by Penzias and, and Wilson. In 1964, Penzias and Wilson detect some noise, as you know, in the signal coming from a radio telescope. And their aim was to improve the quality of the wave transmission between continents. They tried to eliminate the noise using several means, cleaning the antenna, for example, and to trap, and they try to trap pigeons flying around the antenna, changing the orientation of the antenna and so on, the noise remained. But at a certain moment, Dickey and Peebles in Princeton, and Peebles has just received the Nobel Prize uh, some days ago in physics, Peebles and Dicke realized that the energy of this noise corresponded exactly to the temperature of the universe, if the latter would have expanded, as Georges Lemaitre, cosmology said. The theoretical prediction coming from Lemaitre, Big Bang cosmology, was therefore put in connection with this stable and invariant observation made by Penzias and Wilson. But Penzias and Wilson were two engineers of the Bell Telephone Company, and they are not at all interested in cosmology. But, but they had some connection with Dicke and Peebles, and Peebles and Dicke realized this correspondence. And then, and then, in cosmology, we eliminate completely the steady-state cosmology of uh, the Cambridge trio, Hoyle, Bondi, and, and Gold. But you cannot, you cannot understand this uh, story without the notion of truth. What, what does it mean? It means that you have a theoretical framework, you have data, but what is interesting is not to say, well, the, the data of Penzias and Wilson are saved, salvare apparentias, are saved by, by uh, artificial model, uh, ad hoc model. No, no, no. In, in fact, the, the model in cosmology, the theory of Big Bang cosmology, gives a deep meaning uh, which... Uh, in fact, built a, a, an understanding, a understanding frame uh, for this data, then it is impossible to, uh, to understand deeply this history without this notion of uh, correspondence, and then without the idea of, uh, of truth. The question very often uh, the question very often arises to know if cosmology reached a, a truth in the sense that it's able to reach a correspondence between a theory, a cosmological model coming from uh, general relativity and astronomical or astrophysical data. In fact, today, cosmology is uh, become precisely a real scientific, uh, scientific field because it is able to show that theoretical statements can be confirmed by very different approaches. For example, we can extract information on the early universe using, of course, the data coming from the CMB, but we can follow a very different track, studying the observation of the amount of chemical elements, the ratio between helium and hydrogen, for example, that is depending on the condition uh, at the beginning of the universe. 
And these different observational tracks have to give you converging uh, results. If not, you have to give up some feature of the model or even the model itself. But what is animating all these uh, processes is, in fact, uh, the search uh, of a correspondence between models or theories and uh, data, and the convergence of some different, very independent and very different tracks uh, is a, a clue, is uh, a way to discover some element of reality. In the same vein, I know a very interesting work dedicated precisely to reject some theoretical model the Randall syndrome model, based on brains, parallel universe. If the parallel universes exist, we can predict that some particles could be observed coming from them, and the detection could be a clue for the existence of some other brains. This work would have no meaning without the idea of truth as a correspondence between a theory and some reality existing in, in the brains and that could be detectable in our universe. In fact, there are, uh, there are scientists uh, who are trying to detect some particle coming from these, these, these brains. And they are tending to eliminate some theoretical models uh, on the basis of, of this data. But all this activity has, has no meaning without the truth notion because they are supposing that there, there exists some reality, physical reality in some parallel universe, okay? And then you try to have some correspondence between traces coming from this parallel universe and the theoretical framework uh, you have built. But without this notion of correspondence, without the notion of truth, all these activities is meaningless. Another example coming from history. Blondelot in Nancy, a French physicist in uh, 1910, and his student pretended that they have discovered in 1995 in uh, a new type of race, like the X race. They call N race, N for Nancy. But in fact, it was not true. It was only a side effect of the observation, more precisely, of the photographic plates used to detect the effect of this rays on cathodic rays. An assistant changed the experimental device, removing the source of N rays. And in fact, one realized that they did not exist. Nearly everybody continued to observe the N rays in the absence of the source, but they observed something else a phenomenon that emerged from the plates, from the photographic plates. And long after, some teams in the United States pretended to have discovered nuclei with extremely high weight, the anomalons. But in fact, the signal was in fact produced by the detection instruments and not by nuclear reality. Modifying the instrumentation device showed that the instability of the signal and the absence of the anomalons. And in fact, they discovered that there did not exist this relation between the theory of anomalons and, and the data. You are modifying the instruments and the reality disappears, then there is no co truth correspondence between the, this presupposed reality and, and the, the theory. And we, we, can, we can multiply the example. I don't want to multiply the example, but in biology, for example, it's the same thing. We have the same conception of truth. If you consider, for example, the theoretical proposition that snakes have, in fact, emerging, um, emerging from an evolution from the lizards that lost their legs, you cannot be content only searching some fossils and comparing morphologies. You try to complement these observations by other one, for example, epigenetic mechanisms explaining uh, how some dialogue pathways between genes have disappeared in the snakes and existing in lizards, and 
This can be done performing experiments on snakes, the, the famous experiment of Cheryl and, and, and Tickles on uh, gross factors, and uh, to prove that, in fact, uh, the evolution between lizards and, uh, and, and snakes is not due <laughs> to uh, genetic modification, but to uh, epigenetic modification. All observations and experiments in natural sciences are based on a methodology that it is trying to extract a signal that remains stable under some changes. Change of instruments, change of point of view, change of reference frame. But this can only be understood if you are considering that science is trying to establish a connection between a language and a reality that is at least partly independent of scientific point of view. And the frequent objection. Maybe you just need to move to the mouse because. Ah, ah oh, it, it, it's a bit, okay, okay, <laughs> excuse me, I, excuse me. Okay. Then all, all the scientific activities, if, if you consider history or if you consider the contemporary, in fact, uh, process of science, you can establish this. Uh, we are trying to extract invariants, in fact. Invariants under changes, changes of instrument, changing of procedure, changing of reference frames in physics, uh, and, and, etc. But what does it mean? It means that we are tracking some invariant in the relation between the language and the reality. Because if you can object that reality is produced by your language, reality is produced by your instrument, and it is true, sometimes reality is produced by your instruments, the N rays, the anomalons, and so on. But in fact, science is not just to say, well, I have a theory, I have data, I have explained the data, okay. No, you have to prove that your, your uh, signal is, is stable under some changes. For example, Big Bang cosmology. You say, well, CMB have proved the uh, uh, Big Bang cosmology, for example. It is not true because it is not really Big Bang theory. You have proved that there is some kind of hot, high density state at, at, uh, in the early universe. Okay, but uh, with the CMB, it is one, uh, one track. But you have observation of far uh, supernovae you have observation coming from uh, nuclear physics, the, the primitive nucleosynthesis, and you, you have convergence of many tracks, and the something remains. Something seems invariant. Then you can deduce that there is some kind of correspondence between your idea, your languages, and something, some otherness, which is reality. But this is the truth notion. And nearly all uh, scientific activity cannot be, cannot be, in fact, under, really understood without, without this notion of uh, truth and the search of an invariant uh, reality, if you want. The search of truth is, in fact, deeply written in the structure of physical theory. And I, I have to, I want to give maybe a formal example, but uh, which is very important. Because you can say, well, uh, okay, truth is uh, aim uh, and, and so on, but you can build uh, theories, and, and in fact, theory are, are built on some on some, uh, starting from some uh, uh, intuition coming from observation, from arbitrary uh, choices and so on. But in fact, what I want to stress here, that the, the formalism, the formalism of, of physics reflects something of the, the truth search. And I, I have to give this uh, example. Let us look at the structure of mathematical theory of physics. There is something very interesting. The theory has to be covariant under some transformation. Cover covariance is the fact that the equations have to be 
the form of the e equation have to be uh, have to remain invariant under some changes. For example, in classical mechanics, equations have to be covariant under the Galileo group. And the form of the New New Newton equations, for example, does not depend on the change of inertial frame, for example. Okay? You have some, some kind of independence of the formal structure of Newton equation. Uh, from the uh, inertial uh, referential frame. The Einstein special relativity theory is covariant under the Poincaré group, Lorentz group, and translation. Quantum mechanics is invariant on, under unitary groups, uh, which means that probability are preserved. Uh, covariance groups are at the root of the building of, of the theory of physics. We impose covariant group of transformation, then we build a Lagrangian, and then we compute the fundamental equation using a variational principle. It is maybe uh, abstract, but the, the idea is, is this. The structure of the language of the, in theoretical physics has to reflect the fact that the theory is not dependent of a special point of view, if you want. Okay? I apologize. Uh, for this simplification, but you have to express that in the language, that the theory is not dependent on you, on, on your point of view. No, something is imposed, uh, which is in fact describing the, the, the possibility to describe an invariant, okay? But if you change, you, you look here and you describe the reality here, I'm starting from this, point of view, and I describe this reality. This reality, for example, and I describe, and if I change the reference frame, okay, and I see a computer, and now here I, I see an elephant. It's, no, there is something which is, is not good in my perception. I have illusion, or it is not a reality. It is a computer which is also an elephant. No, it's, but in fact, in physics, you are expressing in the language that if you change the point of view, something has to be remain invariant. But what does it mean? It means that you have, you have exhibit some element of reality, and also you, you have established a connection between your language and your several point of view and reality then it is very interesting to, to, to note that not only in history, but also if you anal analyze precisely the structure of the formal language of, of theoretical physics, you see, you can check, that there is some condition saying, well, this activity is an activity, is a truth search, searching activity. Okay, well, there are also some, uh, some other elements coming from, and I have to conclude by, by this, the, the, the question of commensurability and, and truth. In history of science, you probably know this idea that science is changing and the truth is also changing. Truth in classical mechanics is not the same as truth in quantum mechanics, and there are some uh, paradigms, and we, we have, if you refer to Kuhn, the change of uh, paradigmas and so on, with some kind of incommensurability between paradigm, okay? And this idea is some kind of modification of the uh, truth uh, notion uh, along the history. But in fact, if we look carefully to the structure of scientific theory, it is, it is not completely true. There is something of, of the truth which is maintaining along the history of science. It is not true to say, for example, that in quantum mechanics, you have a completely different truth as in, in classical mechanics. It is not true because you can prove, and the physicist in, in the room, can prove that, in fact, the structure of quantum mechanics can be obtained by 
a non-commutative deformation of the symplectic structure you have in classical mechanics. You replace the Poisson bracket by the commutator, and then you have something new, of course, non-commutative <laughs> geometry, if you want, non-commutative physics. But there is something in classical mechanics which is preparing the structure of, of uh, quantum mechanics. A deformation, it is completely different, but it is preparing by something. And of course, classical mechanics is always true uh, in, in our sphere, in a macroscopic sphere. Okay? Well, thus, I, I can say the, the, the following thing. Even informal, this is my conclusion. Even in formal science, truth relation is emerging, the relation between formal language and model formal reality. Back and forth procedure between language and model seem internalizing the relation between theory and reality in empirical science. In empirical sciences, the necessary condition of a search for truth are, is present in experimental protocols and theory. In experimental protocols, invariance, stability of the signals under instrumental changes, under sto stochastic noises, and in theory, covariance requirement. Okay? Uh, if we consider the history, we see also that theoretical frames are not at all independent. They are related by deformation, by approximation, showing that something is it remains invariant. Invariance is in fact the clue of a relation with the reality. We are changing something that depends on us and something remains invariant. The importance of symmetries and invariance inside physics is a clue of the fact that in this field we are tending to find relations with something that is not dependent on us. And what is worth noting is the fact that we are able to translate the necessary condition of these relations in our theory and to implement the letters in our experimental and observational protocols. Then, my thesis and the proposition for the debate is we cannot understand formal and natural sciences today without this notion of correspondence, which is the traditional definition of truth as adequate theory et intellectus. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.